Good morning and welcome to Photo Justice Photo Moment Live Daily Week Daily Photography Show on YouTube. And of course, you can watch it later as you may be doing right now. So welcome, welcome. Hope you had a fabulous weekend. It is a Monday. It is cold outside here. I don't know about where you are, but it is chilly. I'm missing Mexico right about now. And um, one of the things, I'm always looking for new content for this show. As you might imagine, when you're doing a daily show of any sort, content is something you kind of need a lot of. And one of my regular viewers, Mr. Uh, Mr. Graham Park, Am I doing that right? Yes, Graham Parker. Sorry, Graham. Um, asked if I would consider doing a photo critique, a little photo review of some of his shots. And I got to be honest, I was a little hesitant because quite often people ask for these things and the picture they send you is not good. And you really don't want to be mean, but you want to be honest. So it's a, it's a balance. You know, photo critiquing is, is, a, is a delicate art. Let's put it that way. But I said, sure, why not? And Graham sent his photos, and they're awesome. So I really love Graham's photos. So let's talk a little bit first about what he's doing before I show you the pictures. So here's the deal. Um, Graham, I'm just going to read some of my notes here. He sent me a very, very long email. Lots of details. Um, so Graham, uh, photography is a part-time business for Graham. And specifically what he shoots is dogs. I, Cocker Spaniels is what he's got. I don't know if that's kind of like he just shoots Cocker Spaniels, but he shoots dogs. Um, Doug's dog does dog portraits, fun dog portraits. Last year, he shot 40 full days of shooting dogs. Okay. So 40 days, you know, I mean, that's definitely part-time, right? In those 40 days, he shot 1,500 dogs. That's 1,500 pups. That is 37.5 dogs per day of his active shooting. That's a lot of dogs in a day. Can you imagine doing that many portraits of anything in one day? Graham does. So his gear is a, a Nikon DX body with a 10.5 millimeter fisheye lens so that turns it into a, uh, a 1.5 X crop factor. So that makes it a 16 millimeter lens. And he wanted this really wide field of view. And you're going to see why in a moment. He wanted this really wild field of view. He was looking for a new lens, found the fisheye lens. Obviously, fisheyes have distortion on them, but in Lightroom, he can correct for some of that distortion. So in his mind, he gets kind of a best of both worlds. He can go distorted or not. He can fix for that, um, correct for that or not. And that's up to him. So cool. Um, he, the style of photography that he's doing, let's just bring up a picture. Let's just do that. Let's just throw up one of these up in the corner here. Like so. Okay. The style that he's doing is sun in the background. So strongly backlit, but then a strong strobe onto the pup to illuminate the dog, illuminate the foreground. And you get this really kind of high contrast stylized, I'd call it a commercial look to it. Really cool. Really nice look, right? Um, and he's been trying to come up with his own taste, take on this and just kind of really devise his own look for it. So excellent, which is a super good thing to do. Now he says, this is kind of funny. He bought a, um, a big a thing called round, round flash dish. It doesn't matter. It's, um, this guy right here. He bought this thing, the, the big, huge thing attached it to his flash. You can see his flash on a bracket off of his Nikon, but that diffusion thing was so big that it obscured part of the lens or got in the way of the lens, the, the fish eye, the really wide lens could see it. So he ditched that and is just using the diffuser that came with the flash. And that is a what does that say? Uh, can't quite read it. Pana Pro something. Anyway, wait, it's, it's not a Nikon flash. It's a bigger strobe that he's got on there, probably getting a bit more output. So cool. So he's got a really nice, strong, powerful light, probably refreshes really fast. Bonus to buying these, um, you know, third party extra big lights. So that's all good. So that's what he's got. Oh, Pixa Pro. There we go. We'll put a link to this guy in the notes. The Pixa Pro 360 ITTL. And the ITTL is probably telling us that it actually is a TTL or through the lens light with the Nikon. So bonus there. So the type of shot that our man visualized, pre-visualized was bright, fun, quirky, lens flare, starburst on the sun, uh, big blue sky, close up, and something a bit different from the standard dog portraits. I have no idea what a standard dog portrait is, but I would say he has achieved something pretty cool here. So I like it. Let's take a quick look at it full size. Look at this pup. There's that one. And then, oop, not full. There we go. And now I really like this one. I think this one came out really good. I like this one a little bit better. Um, that one's nice, but this one is, is really cool. I think that's a beautiful shot. Digging it. Okay, so uh, he posted a few of these up on Facebook. Got some really great feedback on that, so that's awesome. Um, I guess what he was saying, if I remember right from the earlier note, he, when he posted them on the dog photography groups, he got really great feedback. When he posted on photography groups, not quite as positive with the feedback, but, you know, photographers, were all a cranky bunch, so if you don't like it, who cares? At the end of the day, it's the client who matters, right? If the client likes it, that's what matters. So Graham, that's the first thing I'm going to say to you. If uh, if other photographers aren't liking it, but your clients are, and the clients are buying it, it's other photographers can piss off. Who cares what they think? You're making an image that you like. 
you're making an image that your client likes, that's all that matters, right? Right, excellent. Now there's always you know, uh, ways to increase your, your technical chops and maybe make the image technically better and so on. But at the end of the day, if the client likes it, that's what matters, right? Right, okay. So then he wants to get into the tech. He says, my camera settings were aperture party, 1 60th of a second, F22 and ITTL speed light. So basically, um, is man, well, aperture party, okay, so he's a, hey, aperture party when you're shooting with strobe kind of basically means you're shooting manual because you're choosing the aperture. There's only, a, there's a limited number of shutter speeds that you can work within, right? If you're shooting, your camera probably does a maximum sync at 250th of a second, so that's the highest you could go, which might darken the background a bit. Um, then bringing your shutter speed down to a 60th like he has here is allowing the light from the background to come in. It doesn't say what ISO he's adding here. And if you're playing with auto ISO, then that's going to really be throwing off. You basically choose any shutter speed you want, and the ISO is going to compensate. So let's go through the settings one at a time. Um, 60th of a second. So again, 60th of a second is going to allow the shutter speed, it is a long shutter speed. It's going to allow a lot of light to come in. And that's the sky. That's what is illuminating the sky, that 60th of a second. And frankly, it's full sunlight. So if he's shooting a 60th of a second, um, well, it is at F22. So I guess you could probably get away with... Um, opening up the lens a little bit, and we'll come back to that in a moment. Opening up the lens a little bit, uh, maybe even lowering your ISO. Uh, I don't know what ISO you're shooting. I didn't say that. I kind of wish I had that info. You know, it's probably in here. Hold on a second. Um, here we go. It is on, is it in here? 60 of a second, looking at the metadata. Metadata, metadata, where's the ISO listed on this thing? Um, property, DSC. I'm not seeing it. Why am I not seeing it? It's gotta be in here, right? It has to be in here, 60 of a second. Come on, let's try this again. Running through the list, running through the list. Exif, exposure bias, exposure mode. Flash, focal length, focal length. Good Lord, so much info, and I'm not seeing the one that I want. Well, anyway, that's so funny. It has to be in here, but I'm not finding it. All right, well, it wouldn't be under IPTC. It belongs under exit. Oh, well, whatever. Not finding it. I don't know what it is. Um, I would probably want to go for a slightly faster shutter speed, and here's why. Um, even though you're going to be freezing the dog's motion with the flash, you still have the potential as you're moving around to blur your background simply because you're moving around. So if you're you're bouncing around, you're not setting the camera on a tripod, you're bouncing around shooting this pup, who's obviously bouncing around as well. You know, dogs don't necessarily sit still. Um, you risk running, you, you run the risk of getting your background a little bit blurry. So I would try and bring your shutter speed up a little bit. So that's the first thing. Now he's shooting at f22, and I, I know why he's shooting at f22. He's shooting at f22 because he wants to have the starburst from the aperture that's going to be caused by the aperture that's hitting the sun. Um, the problem with shooting stopped all the way down, and I'm I'm assuming this lens at f22 is stopped all the way down. Maybe it goes to 32, but probably it's, it's stopped all the way down or close to it. Is if you, that's your lens, when you stop that far down, you're only using the smallest bit of the lens. Generally, every lens has a sweet spot. And you can usually look this up. Um, sites like I think DxOMark will do this. They'll tell you, they'll do an analysis and they'll look at where the image is sharpest edge to edge. Typically, it's not wide open, right? Usually, most lenses have a little bit of softening around the edges. And if you're shooting wide open, you're using all of the glass and you tend to pick up a little bit of softening. Uh, not This is not universal, but this is pretty common. Usually, let's say that your lens is an f2.8 lens, the sweet spot might be f3.5 or even f4. This is one of the reasons that people will spend money on the really, really big aperture lenses, like an f1.2 lens. It's not so that they can shoot at f1.2, it's so that they can shoot at f2 or 2.8 and still get maximum sharpness. So just something to consider. So when you're stopping it all the way down, you're really just using the center of the lens. You're not maximizing the quality of the lens. And I'm not saying that you should open it all the way up to F4 or F6 or whatever it might be, because I, I get that you still want that sunburst in there, and that is it's great to be able to get that naturally from the um, from the the shutter, sorry from the aperture. Um, but I would I would experiment. I would see how much you can open it up so that you get you don't need. Uh, you want massive depth of field, I get that, but it, you, you don't need f22 when you're shooting with a fisheye lens. Even at f5.6, pretty much everything is going to be in focus with a fisheye lens. So I would see if you could open it up a little bit. That would be my my recommendation there. Now, the starburst, I'm assuming that this is coming from the lens, but it might not be. This might have been added in Photoshop. He doesn't say. We'll take a quick look at the photo's full size again. Um, he doesn't say if those are added in Photoshop or if they are natural. Um, I'm trying to look into the two of them, seeing if they're similarities or differences that I can kind of gauge that by. 
But given all the other lens flares in there, um, I'm going to assume that it is natural, uh, but maybe not. So who knows? Uh, but anyway, the point being here, I would I would try to open up the aperture a little bit more. Okay. Light TTL speed light, so that's working great for you. Fully automatic speed light, that's awesome. You're getting the light in there. And then he says, so overall there, I mean, I think I think it's great. Uh, I think you've got a great image. Your camera settings are are obviously fine. I would tweak them a little bit, try and play with it, but maybe you find that it just doesn't work if you if you open up a little bit. So you know who knows. You got to try it out. Um, hmm. Looks like my signal's gone wonky. And then uh, let's see here. Oh, one thing I wanted to notice a note on this picture. So now. I don't know much of anything about dogs, but if we look at this photo, the dog's eyes are super clear and bright. We can really see them. Let's uh, take a look at the dog's eyes in here. Can I zoom closer? Kind of, sort of. Um, come here, where's, there we go. Dog's eyes are really nice and bright. I think that looks awesome. We got a nice catch light in the dog's eye. If we look at the previous photo though, zoom in again here and scroll down, it's looking a little bit cloudy. And I don't know if that's a case of the direction that the dog's eyes were looking. I don't know if it's just because it's an older dog and maybe his eyes are cloudy. Um, I don't know. That I don't know. But that's something that on that photo, it kind of bothers me a little bit. So if if the, eyes, if the dog's eyes are perfectly clear, then I would be trying to make sure that that's not happening. And that might be happening because of the... Um, the way the dog's eyes are looking right into the flash or just off the flash, I don't really know. I've, that's not something I've really come across before, but that is something I would look out for. And again, if it's not the dog's eyes themselves, then I would be looking for shots where that's not happening so you get that richness. Because that the richness that we have in this dog's eyes, um, I think looks much, much nicer. So something to consider, something to watch out for. Now, obviously, if the dog's eyes look like that, then that's how the dog's eyes look. There's nothing you can do about it. Um, although, you might even go in there and add a little contrast just to kind of just to kind of take away the the older edge. So if it is an older dog, it's got that kind of fading eyes look. Um, maybe you can kind of bring some of that um, bring some of that youth back into the eyes. Let's leave it at that. Okay. Now, Graham does ask. Um, he says, "I must admit that I'm a little confused with high speed sync." Great. We're going to talk about that. Um, I have always I have it always turned on. Ah, but I'm not totally sure if it operates with aperture priority mode. I need to <laughs> RTFM. Yeah, you do. Um, maybe because it's f22, I didn't need it. Normally, I use it in manual, but I didn't have the time just to experiment and just wanted to get safe shots and see what happened and then adjust. Okay, fine. So high-speed sync. Let's, let's understand high-speed sync. High-speed sync is designed so that you can shoot at a higher shutter speed than what your camera's normal sync speed is. So most modern cameras sync speed, maximum sync speed is 250th of a second. If you go over 250th of a second with a flash, you'll get a dark band on the top or bottom of the frame. And that is literally the shutter. You're seeing the shutter in the picture because what, ha what has to happen is the shutter has to open, flash fires, shutter closes. At 250th of a second, you can open, hold it open for 250th of a second, and then close it. So during the time that it's open is when the flash fires. You get into a higher shutter speed than that. And what happens is the shutter doesn't open and then close. The shutter opens, but before it gets all the way open, it starts to close. And so what you end up with is a strip of exposure, if you will. So, and that strip gets narrower and narrower depending on the shutter speed. So if you're shooting in eight thousandths of a second, certainly the shutter is not opening, staying open for eight thousandths of a second, and then closing again. The shutter is traveling along, exposing a slit, a tiny narrow slit all the way down over the course of one eight thousandths of a second. So insanely fast how quickly the shutter moves, but that's what happens. So what this means is if you are shooting, let's say that you've got this narrow slit in here and you fire the flash, since the whole thing's never open, you're only exposing that narrow slit. So when you take your shutter speed up to 3 20th of a second or something over 2 50th, whatever your maximum sync is, that's why you see a black bar because that is the shutter's opening. And then let's say, um, Let's see, I can't really do this in the framing here. I'm trying to look for a way to do this in the frame. Okay, here, let's just say this bottom uh, bottom of the desk here is the shutter. Let's get rid of this thing. Is the, uh, sorry, is the bottom of the frame, right? So this is my sensor starts here and my shutter is coming down like this. Here we go, the shutter is, is coming down. Pretend it's full up here, or pretend it's full down here, I mean. It's coming down. If, if the flash fires when it's here, then what happens is you get black. You get this not exposed for what's outside, what you're pointing the camera at. Does that make sense? So that's why you have this mash maximum sync speed. So the way that high speed sync works, it's incredibly clever, is instead of firing the flash once to illuminate the scene, 
it fires at multiple times at extremely, extremely high speed. You don't see it. You're, to your eye, it just looks like a flash. But if you look at it on an oscilloscope, you would see a series of, I think even hundreds of spikes of extremely, extremely short duration flash bursts. And so what happens is, here's your narrow slit. Let's take it all the way up to eight thousandths of a second. Here's your narrow slit going down. Basically, it's going pop, 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 illuminating that narrow beam one flash at a time as it's traveling down. So that's what high speed sync is. So you have to both put the camera, uh, put the flash in high speed sync mode and set the camera at a high enough shutter speed for it to actually do anything. If you are under 250 of the second and you have the flash in high speed sync mode, um, depending on your manufacturer brand, it, it might just go, you don't need this dummy and just turn it off. But if it doesn't, then what's going to happen is it's going to chew through your batteries and it will make recycle time take longer because it's got to fire so many strobes in that tiny amount of time that takes power. And that will, again, suck down your batteries, make your flash take longer to recycle. So the only reason you would need to use high speed sync here is if it was so bright in the background and you're shooting wide open at F2.8 and you've got the super bright background and the only way you can expose it, and forget about the flash for a second, the only way you can get a good exposure of the sky is to shoot it 500th of a second. Now you need high speed sync. But if you are, if your camera settings allow you to shoot at a 60th of a second as you are here, well, let's bring it up a little bit, 125th, maybe 250th of a second, um, and still get an even exposure in the background without having to, um, without having to go above that point, then there's no need to have the high speed sync. So that's what high speed sync is. And I think that was everything. Let me double check. I do believe. Um, totally sure. Um, he's just not totally sure if it operates in aperture priority mode. Um, it should, I guess. Yeah, well, no, because if you're in aperture priority, the flash is, the camera's probably automatically going to say, can't go above 250th, most likely. I, I'm not familiar with the Nikons, and honestly, I wouldn't even be sure. I couldn't answer that for Panasonic cameras without actually trying it out. But usually, you just go manual, right? This is the kind of environment where you're going manual. You're in full daylight. Your daylight's not changing any anything dramatically or anything drastically anytime soon. So you find an exposure that works for your background, put the flash on TTL, and let the flash do its thing and figure out the exposure. Okay. And that is that. So overall, again, let's bring up these pictures again because I think they're awesome. Let's bring this up. Uh, zoom out a little bit so we can see that doggy. I love it. I think it's a great, great couple of photos. Love that pup and love this one here. I think really overall, some very nice images. So good job, buddy. Um, keep up the good work. Share some more as you go. For those watching, I have or will be putting in the, um, in the show notes the links for some places on Facebook where Graham shares his work. There's an icon page and a couple of dog uh, groups, dog, affiliate, uh, dog, what do you call them? Uh, Fixionado groups. So if you're into this kind of photography, you love these kind of dogs, whatever, then go check out those groups and the links are in the notes. All right, guys, that's it. Uh, no questions coming up today. And I know we had a little issue with the stream to start, so who knows how many people are actually here watching. But thanks a bunch for watching and we'll see you guys next time. And as always, hey, if you have ideas for Photo Moment, let me know. I want to hear about it. Let me know. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.